It's my pleasure to introduce both of these uh, gentlemen who are here tonight. Jerry Coyne over there is the Professor Emeritus uh, in the Department of Ecology and Evolution at the University of Chicago. He has written more than 100 research papers and two really excellent books, Why Evolution is True and Faith Versus Fact, both of which I would highly recommend. Um, he's going to be asking the questions for tonight. So welcome, Jerry Coyne. Um, and the other person here who you may have heard of is Andrew Seidel, and he's the, uh, his title is the Director of Strategic Response at the Freedom From Religion Foundation. He is one of uh, their attorneys, and I do have a bio, but I figured, eh, I'm not going to read that. I will tell you a story, though, about Andrew. <laughs> I've known him for many years, but about five years ago, I had the opportunity to listen to Andrew give a talk to a large group of young atheist activists. And the thing is, what do you tell a group of young atheist activists? And he told them, I'm going to give you a talk about how you get the kind of job you want, because a lot of those students may have wanted to get a job doing the sort of thing that he does, which is work in the church-state separation world. And he did a little bit of background. And he doesn't know I'm telling you this. Like, this has stuck with me for five years now. Because he basically said, like, let me tell you how I got my job at the Freedom From Religion Foundation. And he basically said, and I'm paraphrasing here, he basically stalked the people who ran the Freedom From Religion Foundation <laughs> until they gave him a job involving, like, writing articles, sending them his articles, meeting up with them, saying, let me buy you dinner so I can talk to you and sell myself to you as to why you should hire me. And it was very effective. Um, and the reason I mention that is because he's someone who knew for a long time that arguing for church-state separation is the thing that he is the most passionate about, and it's the thing he wants to devote his career to. So when he said he's writing a book, the fact that he's writing a book called The Founding Myth, about this myth that we're a Christian nation, is pretty much like not just in the ballpark, He's hitting the grand slam of the things he's most passionate about when it comes to he's not only an expert in this field, it's the thing that he would be reading about and writing about even if he wasn't in this field. So uh, if you haven't read the book yet, I would highly encourage you to read it. Ask him tough questions when you get a chance. Um, and I will be back at the end of this to moderate the Q&A. But Andrew Seidel. Well, I'm the interlocutor tonight. I've read the book twice, actually three times if you count its first incarnation, which is very different from the version we see today. And I recommend it highly, and you'll like it quite a bit. Um, Andrew wants to call special attention to the footnotes, which I wasn't <laughs> going to do, to show the diligence of his work, his research. And there's a lot of footnotes, so um, did you pay attention to that? Um, what I wanted to do this evening was give Andrew a chance to talk about the genesis of his book, if you can excuse the word oh. genesis, <laughs> and uh, who the audience is, who it's aimed at, maybe talk about a few of his cases in constitutional law, and mainly reprise briefly the contents of the book without giving you too much of a spoiler about what it says. So I'll start off with when I was reading the preface, which is by Dan Barker, the co-president of the FFRF, Dan said that um, that you've been writing this book for years, yeah. ever since he met you in 2010, yeah. which is nine years. So that's a long time. And I just wondered what impels you to write it in the first place. So this actually, this started out as a law review article that just got really out of hand. <laughs> um, I initially was very taken with the idea that the United States was based on the Ten Commandments, that our law and government were based on the Ten Commandments. In 2005, the Supreme Court decided a couple of cases, and one of the cases they struck down a Ten Commandments display, and in the other case they allowed a Ten Commandments display to stay up. And one of the reasons, I'm paraphrasing and oversimplifying here, was that the Ten Commandments influenced our law and our historical for that reason, so that this display is acceptable. And that didn't make sense to me. Uh, there was a Ten Commandments display in Denver where I was going to school at the time. And I wanted to write a law review article about this. And the more that I went through each of the commandments and kind of compared them to America's founding principles, 
I realized that there's just this fundamental conflict between the principles embedded in the Ten Commandments and the principles on which our nation was founded. And that conflict for me made it fair to say that the Ten Commandments were un-American. And that idea started then kind of, I ended up running with it. And it became, well, I mean, not just limit it to the Ten Commandments, I'll look at other principles in the Bible, things like hell, and vicarious redemption through human sacrifice. Uh, and I'll compare those to some of our founding principles in the Bill of Rights. And then from there, I was like, well, I'm, I'm, this is already way, <laughs> way, way more than I thought it was going to be. So I, I just kind of kept going with it. Um, but really, it was to push back against uh, bad history being used in our courts to decide cases and eventually violate the separation of state and church. And so part three of the book is the Ten Commandments part. Part two of the book is comparing the Bible to these. And um, so they all made it in there. But it was it was just a law review article that got way out of hand. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering what law review would publish something like this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, n none, is, as it turned out. <laughs> um, I've written a couple law review articles since and limited myself. I actually wrote a historical review recently about on the, if you look at the, the manuscript of the Constitution, at the very end it says uh, written in, or done in the year of our Lord. And that actually is a big argument for Christian nationalists. And I wanted to trace how that word made it onto the manuscript itself. And uh, so I did a lot of historical research and really dove into the archives for this one. It was a really fun review to write. And that one got published very, very quickly in Constitutional Studies. Um, turns, out it, turns out that most of the founders didn't know it was even on there. Uh, the scribe, uh, a guy named Jacob Chalice, <laughs> put it on there while they were debating some other really important things. Uh, so most of them signed it likely without even knowing that it was on there. But, hey, you mentioned Christian nationalism, which wasn't a term I'm really familiar with at the beginning, but it's clear that the underlying theme of this book is to fight the rising tide of Christian nationalism. Maybe you could tell us a bit about what it is, why Trump is considered a Christian nationalist, even though I thought Trump was an atheist before. I mean, <laughs> well, he thinks of himself as God, so we can't call him an atheist. He thinks of himself. Okay. What exactly is Christian nationalism? So Christian nationalism is the idea that the United States was founded as a Christian nation, that we are based on Judeo-Christian principles, and that somehow we have strayed from that foundation. And that's the, actually the really important part of Christian nationalism, that we've gotten away from our religious roots and we need to get back. And that language of return uh, and getting back to the religious roots is what they use to justify many of the overtly religious policies that you are seeing today. Um, your Christian nationalism would include things, um, well first, let's say that it actually, it, before the 2016 election, it was an impotent sideshow. Okay, this was, it was on the fringes of conservative politics, on the fringes of conservative religion, but Donald Trump tapped into Christian nationalism in a way that we've, we'd never seen before. And if you look at the best indicator for a Trump voter in the 2016 election, it was not their race, it was not their religion, despite how much we hear about evangelicals supporting Trump, it wasn't their political party even, it was believing that the United States was founded as a Christian nation. Right, so that was the best indicator of a Trump voter in the 2016 election. So he rode a wave of Christian nationalism into the most powerful office in the world. And since then, he has been legislating that Christian nationalism into a public policy. Um, the immigration ban, that is Christian nationalism. Uh, the move of the embassy to Jerusalem is another element of Christian nationalism. And it's happening at the state level, of course, too. I mean. Everything that you're seeing with the abortion laws that are being passed, these draconian abortion measures, it's Christian nationalism. It, it, it is putting the Christian religion into law. The goal really is to redefine what it is to be an American. So that to be an American is to be a Christian, and to be a Christian is to be American. And then to reshape the law accordingly. So that Christians are a favored class, and all non-Christians, be they a religious minority or atheists, are this are second class citizens a subclass that is that is the goal and if you read some of their their internal materials they're pretty darn clear about what they're trying to do 
So, I mean, Trump never struck me as religious. Before he ran for president, I was under the assumption he was an atheist. Mm -hmm. He doesn't go to church, does he? I don't know. I mean, I've never seen him in church. Right? Yeah, only when it's politically convenient. Okay. I mean, so, I mean, we, he, we saw him at church just a few days ago after he went golfing. And if, uh, oh. So why big... does he have this immense appeal for Christian nationalists if he's not really much of a Christian? And he, he speaks their rhetoric is, is a big part of it. And he gives them, he puts their policies into practice. He's giving them things that they want. Uh, you know, it's one of, the, one of the more interesting things, at least from our side, is that we... Secular Americans, I think, do a pretty bad job of talking about state church separation in one respect, and that is that we don't talk about the benefit to religion enough, because 70 at least percent of the country, depending on what study you're looking at, are, are believers. Uh, so we need to explain to them why state church benefit is use, or state church separation benefits them as well. And um, James Madison put it really nicely. He said that religion and government will both exist in greater purity the less they're mixed together. And what he meant by it, it's one of the reasons we're keeping religion out of government is also to keep government out of religion in a way. And what you're seeing with Trump, and I think some religious groups in the country are getting fed up with this, is him using religion as a political weapon, as a tool to ensnare voters. I think you're right that he's completely disingenuous about it. But it gets him votes if he speaks the language. He doesn't have to walk the walk, for sure, we know that. But if he speaks that language, they're going to go out and vote for him. Yeah, so, I mean, in terms of his personal behavior, he's hardly what you call yeah. an upright Christian. He's basically immoral, he's a liar, a <laughs> serial philanderer, etc. They don't care about that as long as he gives them what they want. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, I think, that, I think that's a fair, fair restatement. And does his sort of dictatorial mean play into the appeal to him? I, I absolutely think that's true. This Trump as the strong man as this bully up there in the pulpit. I mean, if you are a Christian of deep faith and you've been brought up in this religion from your youngest days, you Trump is the biblical God, right? He is a bully on that, on that level. And if you are taught to obey and revere a bully like the biblical God, it makes sense that you would also revere Trump in that same way. It's transference. And I talk about this pretty extensively in the book because I think there's a really good argument to be made that the authoritarian, totalitarian leanings of Trump really remind Christian nationalists of their biblical God. And that's one of the reasons they're so attracted to him. Well, we can, I don't want to give away too much of what's in the book, but... No, let's give it all away. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a well, you bought the book, so it's too late now. <laughs> um, the, the basic set of it, I mean, there's four parts to it. The, the, the nature of the beliefs of the founders of the country, whoever the founders might be, and that's something Andrew talks about. Who do you consider a founder of America? Um, the United States versus the Bible, how much is the country founded on biblical principles? And then the Ten Commandments versus the Constitution, where Andrew actually compares each of the commandments against the constitutional principles. And believe me, the commandments don't come off looking very good. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, and this is the part I, write, I like quite a bit because it's historically interesting, American verbiage. How, how come we still have in God we trust on our money in a secular state? How come the president says, so help me God and God bless America? Um, why the Pledge of Allegiance says, um, you know, uh, has the word God mentioned in it. So, but sort of underlying all this are these two myths that you wanted to dispel. And I had a bit of a, not a problem, but I wanted you to distinguish it, Jim. So there are two myths that you mentioned briefly mm -hmm. um, that underlie the whole book. Could you talk about them and tell why they're different from one another? Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, one of the central claims that you hear and how we define Christian nationalists is the idea that the United States was founded as a Christian nation. How many people have heard that claim? How many people have had a debate, either in person, online, somewhere about that kind of thing? Okay. When you get into that debate, I think probably many people, many Americans certainly understand that we are not a Christian nation. But there's a fallback position that your opponent adopts pretty quickly. And it goes along the lines of something like this. Well, I didn't mean we're founded as a Christian nation. What I actually meant was our nation was based on Judeo-Christian principles. Right? And it's a much vaguer claim. I mean, That's even, two separate claims, right? 
Yeah, yeah. Myth one or myth two. Right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Myth one and then myth two is that backup claim that were founded on Judeo-Christian principles. And that it's it's a vaguer claim because what is a Judeo-Christian principle? If you it, it, people, it doesn't get challenged because people don't even know what that is. It's just assumed to be true. But if you could disprove that second one, you would necessarily blow the first one out of the water. So what, what I decided to do in my book, which is different, I think, from a lot of the other really good Christian nation books out there, uh, was I, I decided to ask the question, did Judeo-Christian principles, whatever they might be, positively influence the founding of the United States of America? And the answer to that is no, they didn't. And in fact, it's a good thing they didn't because those principles are so opposed to the values and the principles on which our nation is built that it is, as I said earlier, fair to say that Judeo-Christianity is un-American. And so that's what I really tried to do in the book is show that those, those central principles in the two different schools of thought or the theology and the school of thought are, are fundamentally opposed and cannot be reconciled, uh, that, that Christian nationalism truly is un-American. So if myth number one was false, mm -hmm. and the founders, or sorry, if myth number one was, was true, that the founders were indeed Christians, that would, that, but myth number two was, was true as well, that the, the nation was founded to have Christian principles. If those principles were adumbrated by a bunch of atheists, that wouldn't matter to the Christian nationalists. So the character of the founders is not really that relevant to the argument. And nevertheless, you spent a lot of time talking about yeah. the nature of that. And I, I do. I, th I think it's really hard to have a conversation about the founding of our nation without talking at least a little bit about the religious beliefs of the founders. But I do try to make the point in the book that, look, th this conversation about what the founders believed, is, it really is fascinating. And it's so much fun to have. But it's beside the point. right? It, it actually doesn't matter to the argument. Because even if they were all what we would consider today to be evangelical Christians, you would still have to show that they then took the principles that were central to their religion and injected them into the government. And you can't do that. I mean, just the fact that they are Christian doesn't necessarily mean that they pulled on Christian principles to found the nation. So I said, let, let's forget about their religion for the most part, and let's focus on the actual principles that they used to build our government. Uh, and I mean, I do, it is a fun conversation to have, and it's really fun to think about, um, you know, who believed what at what, what point. I mean, Thomas Jefferson took a razor to the Bible and cut out all the supernatural stuff, the resurrection, angels. He likened pulling out the good stuff from the Bible to pulling diamonds out of a dunghill. And it doesn't really sound like a Christian to me. And it's fun to talk about that kind of stuff, but it's, it, it kind of gets to, it's a little beside the point when you're having this, this argument. The more important issue is, did they actually look to those religious principles when they were trying to build our nation? And we know that they didn't. We've got the records. And the record also shows, and it's amply documented at the beginning, that at the very best, they were deists. I don't I mean, I guess nobody used the word atheist back then, but do you think, for example, if Madison and Jefferson, and even Washington were, would, you, would they be atheists if they were alive today? I, th I think a lot of them probably uh, would. And you might be able to speak to this, too. I mean, I've heard it said that it was really hard to be, to call yourself an atheist before Darwin. And I don't know, do you think that might be true or not? Yeah, the word wasn't even used. I can't remember, was it Huxley? I think it was agnostic that Huxley count, yeah. but the word atheist was... was deist, right? Deist. So, yeah, they were they were deists, but I mean, yeah. I think I think it was I think it was probably hard to really conceive of that before you had an answer that, that the answer that Darwin gave us. Yeah, um, but I'd be willing to bet. Yeah, it's like Dawkins said that that Darwin finally made atheism intellectually respectable. Yeah, by dispelling the most compelling argument for design, which was I mean for God, which was the design, design of the natural yeah. world. So. Yeah. So if you could have Jefferson here now instead of me sitting next to you, and you could ask him one question. <laughs> what would you ask him? What is it you really believe? Or? That's a, oh man, that's that's a that's a hard one. Oh, I, I mean, I'd probably have to ask him why he continued to own slaves, yeah. given all the yeah. things he wrote. Unfortunately, um, but I mean, he would. He, I mean, he's really just the this, such this contradictory character because he could write about freedom and these ideas mm -hmm. in 
ways that still speak to us today, but then was such, I mean, a, a coward when you come down to it, when he was implementing them in his own life, he, he utterly failed to do so. Um, but I'd, I mean, I'd still love to sit down to dinner with any of those guys and pick their brain. There's actually, uh, there's actually a couple really interesting anecdotes from the Constitutional Convention and some historian, and I, I unfortunately forget, I think it's her, I forget her name, um, tracked down the tavern records from the Constitutional Convention, and these guys were booze hounds like you would not believe. <laughs> I mean, the stuff that they used to drink afterwards was just, they were all, most of them were staying at this one uh, flop house, I guess we might call it today, and uh, I mean, barrels of, of wine and stuff. It was, it's just, it was ridiculous. I'll see if I can dig them up and I'll put them on my social media. Yeah, you somewhere. mentioned they had a taste for the ladies too, right? So. Yeah, well, so one of my favorite founders is a guy named Governor or Governor Morris. We're not actually even sure how to pronounce his first name. Um, he spoke more than any other founder at the Constitutional Convention, and most people don't know about him today. He actually wrote the words, we the people, he gave us those immortal words. He, so he was on the committee of style for the Constitutional Convention. So when they, they, they after they had all, most of their debating done, they knew what was going to go in the document. They had it all written out and, you know, on little slips of paper here and there. They gave it to five guys, the committee of style, and said, okay, make this look nice. And the committee of style gave it to Governor Morris, who was this, he was a peg-legged bonk bonk. That's the, that's the best description of him. He lost his leg in a carriage ac accident. John Jay, the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, said he wished he had lost something else uh, because of the trouble that Oregon caused. The he had, uh, he was just a fascinating character. He was our, our minister to France during the French Revolution, uh, had sex with a married woman who was also Talleyrand's, if you remember Talleyrand from history, Talleyrand's mistress, had sex with her in a convent, in a carriage, uh, all over the place. And the, the way he put it in his diary was, uh, they did the, the, the first commandment that God gave to Adam, uh, meaning they went and uh, were fruitful, but they didn't multiply was essentially how he phrased it. Uh, so they went through the motions, but didn't bear the fruit, something along those lines. It's in the book. Uh, so he's this really fascinating guy, and not what you would think of as a Bible-believing Christian who's going to incorporate Christian principles into a founding document. Well, let's talk about those doctrines for a minute. So... The Constitution doesn't mention God at all, is that correct? Is there any allusion to God in the Constitution? No, there, there's not. I mean, I mentioned that year of our Lord, which is actually not technically in the Constitution. It's in the Attestation Clause, which is not part of the Constitution, and that's something I get into in that, that article I mentioned earlier. Um, and a lot of the states didn't even see that language when they were uh, debating whether or not to ratify the Constitution. The original Constitution only mentions religion once, in Article 6, Clause 3, to actually bar religious tests for public office. And then the amended Constitution mentions it again in the First Amendment. We often forget that the amendments actually did amend the Constitution, uh, which says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Uh, and, and so you have essentially three mentions of religion in the, go in the document, and all of them keep religion out of government and government out of religion. Right? All of them draw this big dividing line which we've interpreted to be this, this wall of separation, uh, Jefferson's words again. The Declaration of Independence, which preceded that though, has more mentions of God. How, um, are those used by Christian nationals? Oh yeah, those are some of the favorites of Could Christian nationals. Could you like, allude to a few of those? Or? So there are essentially four quasi-supernatural lines in the Declaration of Independence that Christian nationalists love to trot out. Um, the laws of nature and of nature's God, endowed by their creator, uh, divine providence, and the supreme judge of the world. And it's really important to understand that, first of all, only six people signed both the Declaration and the Constitution. They were more than a decade apart. I mean, a lot happened in that decade. And the Declaration wasn't really it's a founding document in one sense in that it laid out some of our founding philosophy. But really what it did was sever our political connection with Great Britain. It's a document of destruction primarily, not of building uh, as the Constitution is. And I actually, in the book, I walk you through each one of those mentions 
I, I show what the rough, Jefferson's rough draft of the declaration said and show you where in the editing process that language was added and what, what they meant by it. Uh, but there's two real big takeaways from the declaration. And the first is that it is primarily concerned with this world. Right? It, is, it is a human document. It begins when in the course of human events. It is not at all concerned with the supernatural or with supernatural rights, uh, despite what you hear about God-given rights all the time. Uh, so, I mean, that, that to me is, is one real important part of the Declaration. The second is that I think it's fair to say that the Declaration is anti-biblical. Right? If you look at what the Bible says about obeying government, and that governments are ordained by God, it's really hard to read that and then think, you know what we need to do? Overthrow a government that's tyrannical which is what the Declaration of Independence says. We, we, it says we have a duty to do that. And the Bible says you have a duty to obey it no matter what. The government has the sword. Obey the government. Uh, so I think it's fair to say that the Declaration is fundamentally opposed to the Bible. So, yeah, I mean, one thing that struck me when you're knocking down these allusions to God in the Declaration as well, is there any allusion to God that could have been made that would stymie you and make yeah. you say, well, maybe we really were founded as a Christian nation. I just wonder what... They could have said that would yeah. change your mind. I mean, and it's it's obvious, right? They could have said, "Our rights come from Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior." They could have been very explicit about this at any point along the way. They chose their words very carefully. All of these documents went through tons and tons of edits and debate, but they never did that. They never decided to do that. None of those references are close to explicitly Christian. At best, they're deist. But and and when you pair that with the humanistic nature of the Declaration and the anti-biblical nature of the Declaration, I, it's, I, to me, it's impossible to call that a Christian document. So, yeah, we're, so I'm trying to cover at least all the three of the, all four of the areas um, involved. You, you go on a lot about the Ten Commandments, and I just wondered, because I haven't paid much attention to Christian nationalism, do they really rely heavily on these commandments and say, I mean, they're, they're popping up in front of courthouses throughout the country. You guys are always fighting their installations, mm -hmm. sometimes winning, sometimes losing. Is it that important to knock down the Ten Commandments as a foundational basis for American law, um, to knock down Christian nationalism? I think, I think it really is. And I, the more important thing is that most people have not read the Ten Commandments. And if you ever, if you ever ask a Christian nationalist, you know, what do you mean the Ten Commandments? influence them. First of all, name a Ten Commandments. The one that you always get back is, well, don't kill. That's the one that they always go to. If you're lucky, you'll hear don't steal, too. They completely ignore, for instance, the first commandment, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. I mean, it would be difficult to write a law or a prescription that is more un-American than that sentence. Right? I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. I mean, that is fundamentally opposed to the First Amendment in about 42 different ways. It's, we have the absolute freedom of religion in this country to worship one God, no God, or as many gods as you want. Uh, I mean, if you go on to read the rest of the Ten Commandments, it's worse. Slavery is sanctioned, at least implicitly, twice. Twice in God's most moral law. You'd think that he would get that one right. Don't own another human being. Could have been in there. It wasn't. Um, but even it's even worse things than that. You know, the, the, my my favorite worst part of the Ten Commandments is uh, God says, "Don't worship idols or graven images." Everybody knows that one, right? You know what the punishment is for that? Don't do it because for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of the parents to the third and fourth generation. The Ten Commandments promise to punish innocent children for the crimes of the parents for four generations. I mean, that is fundamentally immoral and very clearly un-American, despite what's happening at our southern border right now. And you laugh about that a little bit, but like the, the child separation policy at our southern border was justified by Jeff Sessions citing Romans 13, I mean, citing, citing the Bible. I wrote a piece about this for Think Progress. What was the citation? Uh, essentially, they're saying that if you break the law, you should expect whatever consequences may come, however harsh they be. And we, we tied this directly to the White House Bible study that we knew Jeff Sessions was attending, 
uh, which was being it was that that was being preached at the White House Bible study, and they used it to justify this this barbaric policy. I think Christopher Hitchens, if you watch YouTube, has some analysis of the Ten Commandments and replaces them with new humanistic commandments. And, and that's um, that was an article for Vanity Fair. Uh -huh. And if you look carefully at the footnotes, you'll see that that was um, partly what inspired me to write that uh -huh. law review article that got out of hand. I owe a big thank you to Christopher Hitchens for this book. And so I just wondered, I mean, the Ten Commandments are so palpably thin as a foundation for American law. I mean, thou shalt not kill is in present in every culture, in every law, mm -hmm. whether it's Muslim or Hindu or whatever. So, have you ever debated a Christian on the commandments? And not a not a formal debate on on the commandments per I'm se. I'm just wondering how they managed to justify the foundation of this government on a group sanctions that are most of them don't have anything to do with the law or the foundation of America. And, and the formulation in the Ten Commandments is actually worse because it only if you if you really understand what they're trying to say in the Bible, it's not thou shalt not kill. It's thou shalt not kill one of your neighbors, which means another believer. And if you, I, I lay this out in the text, it's very clear that it's perfectly acceptable to go out and kill other people who are not believers. I mean, the next book of the Bible, if you go, go to Joshua, for instance, if there's 70 genocides in Joshua that God okays or helps commit. Uh, so it's very clearly okay to kill. It's just not okay to kill your fellow believers. And, but you're right, you know, I have a chapter on um, the golden rule. Which is this? It's and it's hard to I even think even make the argument that the golden rule is the foundation of the United States of America. But let's just assume that's the case for a second. That is a universal human principle that every successful society we know of has come up with on their own. To call that a Christian principle or a Judeo-Christian principle is arrogant. I mean, it's it's rampant arrogance of the kind that typically atheists and scientists are accused of by believers. Well, I would like to move on to the last part, which particularly interested me because it's a historical thing. It's called American verbiage, um, how religion has persisted um, in America now, despite the fact that it's not supposed to. And I have a list here. Let's see if I can find it. Um, yeah, so here's the remnants of religion in our law that I have a list. So it's on the money and God we trust, mm -hmm. Pledge of Allegiance, there's a chaplain in Congress, which I guess is paid for by the taxpayers. Yeah, we spend um, about $800,000 a year on chaplains for the US Congress. Their only duty is to say a prayer before the opening of the session. They give that duty away about 40% of the time to guest chaplains. Uh, but we have a, So we have a, a chaplain in the House, a chaplain in the Senate, and when I last looked, they had five assistants between the two of them. I'm just wondering, what, where does that eight hundred thousand dollars go? Sal salaries. That's just the they salaries. make a lot of money for saying this. Yeah, prayer. no. Cha the chaplains make um, r their their governmental level is incredibly high. Uh, for instance, they're the same as the chief information officer for NASA. They're making uh, one of them was making one twenty five. One of them makes, was making one fifty a year to say prayers before <coughs> Congress. That's eight hundred thousand dollars a year that our our Congress is spending on prayers. You know, the other things I've written down are Sunday closing laws. These are all addressed in the book, their history and their legal defense. The National Day of Prayer, the National Prayer of Breakfast, Prayer Room in the Capitol, um, God Bless America, and the fact that um, presidents now say God Bless America. Apparently they didn't do that back in the old days. And yeah, no, that, and that, that's one of my favorite stories from the yeah. book, and I'll, 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 I'll give it away. But yeah. So God Bless America... I mean, everybody has heard a president end a speech or a, a talk with that, right? Presumably, hands. You can show them. Yeah, yeah. So the first time that was done to close a presidential address was to, by Nixon, in his address from the Oval Office on Watergate. <laughs> yeah, and it act, but it's actually really interesting. Why? I mean, why would you start invoking religion? And and Nixon was a VP for Ike, and I mean, he was there during the rise of the Christian nationalism in the 1950s when you saw uh, things like the National Day of Prayer, the National Prayer Breakfast, under God, added to the pledge, uh, in God we trust, on money and on a stamp. That was all in the 1950s when uh, Nixon was VP, and then. When he was struggling with his own, in, what was very clearly going to be impeachment, he started kind of turning to religion again. I think to distract the country and also say, look, I'm religious, I'm obviously a moral guy. And there's this, this 
instance where he, he starts to go on a southern tour because he's worried about um, shoring up some support to prevent impeachment. Uh, so he's going to do this swing through the south to uh, rally the people so that they can push their Congress people, congressmen at that time uh, to not impeach him. And he starts at the Grand Old Opry. And you can see this on YouTube. And he sits at the piano and plays God Bless America and sings it. And it is excruciating <laughs> to watch. Um, but then he, he really starts turning to religion more and more the, the closer he gets to losing the office. Um, and I think it's to, sh to try to use it as a proxy for morality with the voters. Yeah, it seems like a lot of the times God crept into the government was times of national trouble under Eisenhower, for example, the Red Scare and stuff. What struck me most was the money. Yeah. You know, what, what was Ben Franklin had some motto in the earliest coins that was completely different from what yeah. was that? Yeah, there's two, there, uh, uh, one of them was la mind your business yeah, mind and, your and business. time flies <laughs> were the, the two sort of mottos that were on there. Um, and and there was a science statement too, right? Wasn't there remember some of the money about? Yeah, I mean, the, well, the, the, so the striking, over, the overall striking thing about these phrases, in God we trust, one nation under God, God bless America, is what you just said, that they entered our vernacular at times of national fear and strife. And it's not just that they entered our discourse then, it's that they were deliberately pushed upon the country at that time by Christian nationalists, who were knowingly, for the most part, taking advantage of that time of national fear and crisis to impose their religion on everybody else. And you very clearly can see it when In God We Trust was added to our coins uh, in 1863, 1864, which I, I tell that story in the book. Uh, and you can also see it very clearly in the 1950s when it was not just the Red Scare, but also big business was trying to repeal a lot of New Deal era regulations. And they were actually literally trying to sell religion to the American people. Uh, with the Ad Council and Mad Men. Uh, and so we, I tell that story in the book. And then um, I, already, I already mentioned the Nixon story. So it's, it's these times of national fear and strife where religion is deliberately imposed on us. And one of the things that I try to do in the book is not arm you with just better facts, more accurate facts, but also better stories and better arguments to push back against Christian, Christian nationalism. Because really, facts are not enough, unfortunately. Otherwise, we wouldn't have President Trump, right? <laughs> we live in an era of alternative facts. So we have to have better arguments for our side. So point, you, it's one thing to point out, well, hey, look, in God we trust is clearly not a statement of our founding ethos because it doesn't come from the founding era. Ben Franklin wanted this other thing on the coins. But it's much better if you can also turn around and say, look, it actually wiped out this unifying sentiment that was on our coins, e pluribus unum. You took religion, the most divisive force in human history, and put it where previously we had this really nice unifying force. Same thing with the Declaration, or excuse me, the Pledge of Allegiance. One nation indivisible was literally divided with God. You're dividing the indivisible with God. One nation under God, indivisible. And so, I mean, I think pointing out and trying to make some better arguments, and this is one of the reasons that I use the phrase, the word un-American in the title, is because we need to do a better job of arguing our position, not just stating facts. And you know, we are we are very good about facts and nuance on our side, and I think that um, shackles us sometimes when we're engaging with Christian nationalism. We need to take those shackles off and really start street brawling with them. In my yeah. opinion, let's talk a little about litigation. So, I mean, you explained this in the book, but maybe we could talk a little bit about it. Tom. These are a lot of remnants of religion in a country where the religion is not supposed to be connected with the government. How, is, how do they legally justify? And what are the challenges that have arisen to things like one nation under God or you know, the Pledge of Allegiance? Surely there have been legal challenges to those on First Amendment grounds. There have, and the Freedom From Religion Foundation has been at the forefront of a lot of those legal challenges throughout the years. Um, the, and courts have done different things with justifying them. But uh, one of the central themes is, look, these phrases, in God we trust is a great example, are not really religious anymore. Now, that's a crazy thing for a court to say, in my opinion. But they've said, essentially, through rote repetition, in God we trust as a phrase has lost all its re religious significance, so it can't actually 
be a, pro a state church problem because it's not a religious phrase. But you have, to, you have to appreciate the hypocrisy of that, too. I see many furrowed brows out there, and yes, that is the right response. But it's also, it's fantastically hypocritical of the Christian nationalist because if a court said that about praying the rosary or about the most ubiquitous Bible verse out there, John 3.16, said that, look, you guys have repeated that so much, it's no longer religious, right? Imagine if the court said that about the favorite Bible verse of the Christian right. They would go nuts, and, and frankly, rightfully so. They're, a secular court should not be declaring a very clearly religious statement to be non-religious, um, but they are. So they adopt a lot of these legal fictions to uphold uh, uh, some of these more frustrating. And these, this isn't just one court decision, it's many court decisions. Yeah, yeah it's a and common that They all theme. adhere to the same set of fictions. Yeah, so it's this a common a, hypocritical theme. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, so, yeah, you've litigated yourself in some of these cases. I guess maybe you could talk about one of them and the obstacles you've run up against. The... Yeah, I mean, our side is outgunned uh, financially uh, and just in sheer, by sheer numbers. Um, you know, the, some of the, for instance, the, the group that brought the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, the, the gay wedding cake case out of Colorado, I mean, they have something like, I think, 60 lawyers on staff and a budget of upwards of $50 million a year, which is more than all the secular groups that do this work, the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the ACLU, Americans United, all the other groups combined. Uh, and that's just one on their side. So, I mean, that's a huge imbalance to begin with. Um, <clears throat> the good news is, on the, the flip side of that, is that we are right. <laughs> that sounds so good if you keep losing that, right? <laughs> well, right now, I mean, FFRF in court since 2016, we are 14 and 3. Uh, so we are, are we're, the courts are definitely going to get a lot more unfriendly to us uh, with the way Trump has packed them with conservatives. And, I mean, Christian nationalists, to be honest, too. And there's a decision coming down that FFRF is not one of the parties in the case. Uh, we did submit a brief to the court, a uh, friend of the court brief. Um, but the case, the Bladensburg Cross case is going to come down any day now, and that could blow a huge hole in the wall of separation between state and church. Uh, but uh, as of right now, we are still doing a, a pretty damn good job litigating in, in court and winning. You just can't get in guard and cross <laughs> off the money. Not yet. <laughs> I, do th I do think, though, that, that that is something that will fall. Really? Oh, I do. I, I mean, I don't, know, I don't know when. Look, what you're seeing right now and with Christian nationalism and with this wave of abortion laws is not just trying to take advantage of a friendly court that they have. This, this is all a symptom of churches looking out on Sunday mornings and seeing, instead of young faces smiling back at them, empty pews, right? They can read the demographics as well as we can. And I, what you are seeing, they are raging against the dying of their privilege. If that is what is happening right now. They are gonna, they're gonna do a lot of damage on their way out of being supreme, uh, but they know, that, <laughs> they know that the end is near, to borrow a phrase from, the, <laughs> from their book. It's not that near, though. I mean, we have a Supreme Court now that's gonna well, be- Well, I mean, but, and I, but to me, that's part of the damage that they're gonna do on the way out. But I, I do think they recognize that, that they are, um, I think they see the writing on the wall. I really, I really think they do it. I, so, I mean, there's a certain desperation to a lot of the actions that we're seeing right now. They are, because of the court and because of Trump, they are, they are absolutely emboldened in a way that we've never seen before. And because they see their privileges dying, they're trying to take as much of it as they can while they can. So there's this feeling of entitlement that we are seeing from the other side. And, you, you know, it's not just in... Um, you know, the Christian nationalist push, but we're seeing it even in our litigation. I mean, some of the moves they are trying to pull in court are the most ridiculous and entitled things that I've, I've ever seen. And there's really annoying kind of complicated procedure to try and explain. But, uh, I mean, uh, imagine litigating a case for four years, winning at every single level, the school board finally voting not to appeal that case to the Supreme Court, and then an entire another school board coming in and say, well, we're going to take that case to the Supreme Court. They have nothing to do with the case at all. They weren't sued, not parties, and they actually 
tried to come in and, and litigate this to the Supreme Court. It, it's, it was un, literally unprecedented in the true legal sense of the word. But they allowed them to do no, that. No, they didn't allow them to do that, but they felt entitled to and emboldened to do this. And it, it was, I mean, I think had Trump not been president and not packed to the Supreme Court, they would never have tried something like this. They feel entitled and emboldened. At dinner, you mentioned that the courts are changing their strategy now in an attempt to knock down um, First Amendment defenses. Yeah. Um, and one of them was standing. You might, maybe you can mention that briefly. But also, and we should wind up now because we're close to the end, what should we do or what should you do as a lawyer to try to fight this seemingly impenetrable? Change. Just wait a hundred years until everything's <laughs> secular again, or no? I mean, well, those are two big open-ended questions. Uh, so, how, standing is a very—it's a—it's a strange legal doctrine. And basically, what courts have said is like, look, to, to take a case, you can't just be an American citizen. You have to have some specific interest in the case. You have to be injured by whatever action you are trying to challenge, uh, and we have to be able to to fix that injury. We, the court, uh, that's an oversimplification. There are three different things the courts look at. Uh, but standing has proven to be a massive hurdle for people and groups like the Freedom From Religion Foundation trying to uphold state church separation. Because instead of deciding that the National Day of Prayer is unconstitutional, which it clearly is, I mean, the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, and the National Day of Prayer is a law that Congress made telling people to pray. I mean, you don't get a more clear violation than that. So instead, what the courts have done is say, you can't even bring this case. So it becomes a jurisdictional issue rather than a question about answering, rather than answering the question on the merits. Uh, and that's what they did with the National Day of Prayer case that FFRF bought, uh, brought. We successfully got it declared unconstitutional at the Federal District Court. And then the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals said, you don't have standing to bring this case. And in fact, if that means nobody has standing to bring that case, so be it. Which is a very strange thing to say. If you have a constitutional right, you have to be able to vindicate that right in court, or you don't actually have that right. Um, but my prediction is that courts are going to stop using standing to avoid deciding these issues. Because the courts have been flooded with conservative judges who want to decide against us, they're going to start saying, yet yeah, you have standing, and yet yeah, you lose. That's, that's my prediction on it. Um, so what we can do is, I mean, a number of different, the courts are not going to be, we talk about them as unfriendly for a generation, and I think to a large extent that's true, but there, there are some solutions to that. There are some political solutions. Also, the court is not going to be static, and it's going to, it, the makeup is going to change. Uh, we'll see whether or not it gets worse before it gets better. Uh, and there, again, there are political solutions, I think, to, to a very political Supreme Court. Uh, so we'll see, we'll see where that goes, and a lot of that's going to depend on the upcoming election, presidential election. Keep your fingers crossed. Huh? <laughs> well, I think we've you know pretty much exhausted or appreciated the book. Um, I recommend it highly. You'll see a lot of stories and anecdotes and law that you haven't we haven't talked about tonight. So um, I suppose I should, we should turn the floor over to the audience now and to Andrew. So. He's open for questions. I guess Hamon, is he going to moderate or something? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, OK. Um, so we're, Bruce, where would you like him to stand with oh, us? Come over within 15 feet of the mic. All right. Do you, do you want to take the mic? Do you want us to take the mic? Or, you want to take the mic around? And... Uh, no. Um, the mic is there now. <laughs> so if you have a question, ask us. I can repeat it here if we need to get it uh, on the microphone. Um, as you're thinking of questions, um, I did have one that I wanted to ask you, and I know it's not an FFRF case, but in the next week or two, the Supreme Court is going to decide on whether a giant public cross that is a World War I veterans memorial that the supporters say it's just in the shape of a cross, it's not Christian. A cross-shaped memorial. <laughs> yeah, a cross-shaped memorial. <laughs> They're going to decide the fate of that cross, and I'm wondering if you want to make a prediction on that. <clears throat> uh, it's going to be bad. It's just a question of how bad. <laughs> um, that's, I mean, that's the prediction. I was, in, I was in the courtroom when Monica Miller from American Humanist Association argued that case. Uh, and you like to think that you can get a read on the judges when you're in oral argument or when you're 
it's really hard when you're having the oral argument. You have a sense of whether it went well or not. Uh, but the last time I thought it went well, all three judges decided against me. So it's, <laughs> um, and it's, it, was, it was hard to read to begin with which, which way you think those justices on the Supreme Court are going to go. Um, the real question in the case is whether or not they're going to overturn the central test that we use to determine what is a state church violation or not. And that's something called the Lemon Test. Um, courts have been not applying it in other instances. It's very much maligned. Um, but the other side's goal would be to get the court to adopt a new standard, which would essentially require you to show that the government is coercing you into some sort of religious practice to show that the First Amendment is being violated. And if you can't show that you are being coerced, then there's no violation. So unless you have a smoking gun, <coughs> that's the fear? Yeah, and so that's sort of the worst case scenario. Um, and on, if that happened, we would see what, Christian crosses go up everywhere? I mean, yeah, I don't want to offer them any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean, a best case scenario still going bad is the court issuing a really fractured opinion where two judges here, two judges there, three judges. Um, that would that would be also positive. It would it would make it very difficult for lower courts to say anything in particular uh, to, about the opinion, and they would likely go back to some of the older case law that's more clear. So that would be that would be a good bad decision. So let's go to questions. Did you have one here first? Yeah. Yeah. Um, about two uh, two institutions of government and their religious disposition. One is Mitch McConnell, who's implicated in a lot of the judge appointments. And then number two is uh, the fact that everybody on the Supreme Court had, comes from a demonstrably religious background, even the liberal justices. Does that color their, um, their reasoning and their opinions that you've seen them issue about uh, religious separation issues? Uh, so, I mean, yeah, we, ought to, we really ought to speak of the Supreme Court not as Trump's court and not as Trump's judiciary, really. It is McConnell's Supreme Court and McConnell's judiciary. It, he is responsible for the makeup far more than Trump is. Uh, I mean, Trump is just a rubber stamp for the uh, Federalist Society and Leonard Leo. Um, there's, what, as to whether or not the religion influences the justices' opinions, you know, I think we all like to think of the Supreme Court and our judges generally as a vindicator of rights that they are out there defending rights. Uh, history doesn't really back up that view. I mean, the Warren Court, uh, the there was a 15 year stretch where, uh, when Earl Warren was the Chief Justice, where you saw some really great opinion. A, a lot of the, the really s massive, important civil rights cases came down during the Warren Court. But the Supreme Court, by and large, waits for public opinion to shift before changing its position. They, they are not as big a protector of civil rights as we think they are. Um, my, one of my law professors likened the Supreme Court to the last person in on an all-team tackle. <laughs> right, they run along and jump on top of the pile and say, look at what we did. Um, and you can kind of see that with the, a good example is the, the uh, Obergefell, the gay, the gay marriage decision. You know, they, they had, that case was teed up for them many times before. Uh, but they waited till public opinion shifted in favor of that before making that decision. Uh, the law didn't change, public opinion did. Um, the, and I, I think they are far more of a political body than we want to think of them as. And I do think, I do think religion influences the Catholic men on the Supreme Court. Uh, it does not seem to affect Sonia Sotomayor, Justice Sotomayor, who's uh, also a Catholic, um, she seems to be able to set her religion aside and decide cases the way the law would dictate, regardless of what her religion says. Uh, the Catholic men on the Supreme Court do not seem to be able to do that. Including Breyer? Breyer's Jewish. Oh, oh he's Jewish. Okay. Yeah. Um, your question was fine, but I should remind everybody, questions end in a question mark. You want to keep them brief <laughs> to the point. Let me go over here. And you can ask Jerry questions, too, about yeah. his stuff. Yeah. While he's here, don't yeah. shut. Um, yes. You had mentioned earlier that uh, 
obviously the founders had plenty of ample opportunity to be, be explicit in, uh, in their language and say whether or not this was founded as a Judeo-Christian nation. Uh, did you find in your research um, founders contributing to the conversation that were trying to push that agenda of having that explicit language in the Constitution? Sure, and I mean, there's a, there a debate, uh, the country had a debate about the godlessness of the Constitution at the time. There were uh, citizens who were, were pissed when it was made public that there was no recognition of God or Jesus in the preamble, that it began we the people instead of uh, referring to God or Jesus. And that was a big argument and a fight that they had. It's not just that the Constitution happens to be godless, it is deliberately godless. Um, so, I mean, and you, uh, there's a really great book, uh, Isaac Kramnik, uh, Kramnik and Moore. Uh, Isaac Kramnik and Larry Moore wrote a book called The Godless Constitution. Uh, I don't remember, I want to say it's maybe 20 years old now, uh, but it still holds up really well. My publisher, I, I, I really should be telling people to buy my book, not theirs. <laughs> my publisher, this is going to be up and she, I'm going to get a call. Um, but it's, it's really worth reading. They, they sort of lay out a lot of that debate that was happening when the country was debating whether or not to ratify the Constitution. Because remember, we didn't just, it wasn't just we had the Constitutional Convention and then we actually, then we had the Constitution and that was it. Uh, there, was, there was two years of public debate about whether or not states were going to ratify the Constitution. You had to get to a, uh, number nine before it would be ratified, and then you would actually, it would go into effect. Uh, that's why we have the Federalist Papers, which are the, these really phenomenal papers, mostly written by Alexander Hamilton and James Madison, a couple by John Jay, that it, do a great job of explaining the ins and outs of how our government was going to work. Can I get a question? Do you mind standing up if you can? Sure. Thanks. Um, Andrew, how long has it been since the beginning of the, the Constitution that uh, federal judges have, you know, Supreme Court judges have a lifetime term? Yeah. Or has that changed? And if that changed to something like 10 years, do you think we'd have the same issues? Or would, is there any way of correcting the problem? So it's Did a good you guys hear that question? No. Uh -huh. So uh, how long have judges have, life, have had lifetime tenure, and would it be <coughs> different if they had uh, an expiration date of 10 years in their position? Yeah. So judges, the lifetime tenure of federal judges is meant as a, it's one of our checks and balances in our system. Uh, it, so everybody remembers back to high school civics that we are a government of checks and balances. It's the reason we have three different branches of government. By dividing up power and sort of decentralizing it, the founders thought, believed they were protecting liberty, not that they were uh, reflecting the Holy Trinity, which is what some Christian nationalists <laughs> argue. Um, that, that's one of the more ridiculous arguments. I think I disposed of that in just a paragraph in the book. Um, and I actually, I think it does a pretty good job. It, the goal was to make the judiciary independent and not beholden to one of the other two branches of government because you don't want them deciding cases politically. And historically, that has proven very, very effective. And one of the reasons that you're seeing um, the outsourcing of the judge selection process to the Federalist Society and Leonard Leo uh, is because Historically, judges have been pretty unpredictable once they get their lifetime appointment on the Supreme Court. Um, Reagan appointed a couple that went rogue and uh, it joined all these liberal decisions. And, and it, it, it happens a lot. And if you look at uh, judges as they age, you know, the conventional wisdom says you get more conservative as you get older. Judges get more liberal. Uh, and so you, you it actually, I like the lifetime tenure. I think it's a. I think it is a. It's a good check on power. It's a good way to ensure an independent judiciary. It just is really terrible with what we've seen in the last two years. Um, that doesn't mean the system is flawed. I mean, look at what happened in the last two years. I mean, that that part of the system is what tainted the judiciary in our minds. And so now we're looking for a way to fix it. And I think there are political fixes to it that don't involve getting rid of the lifetime appointment of federal judges. Uh, I mean, also, you have to remember, too, lifetime appointment back then was a lot different than it is now, right? I mean, appoint, 
appointing a chief justice younger than 50 you know, back in the 1780s <laughs> was a lot different than, than it is now. Uh, so there, there, are, there are 10 years a lot longer than I think the founders expected. So that, that's a better argument against it. And you could put a minimum age on getting into the office, which would be an interesting way to do it, too. Another question? Yes, over here. My great Can you stand up if you don't mind? I'd be glad to. If it's possible, yeah, there you go. My great, great grandfather, great, 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 great grandfather was John Marshall, the second wow. Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Sure. And uh, he made a deal with uh, President Adams. Adams and his group, slave owners, were concerned that the general population in, in, electoral, uh, in, in an election would elect someone who was not in favor of the interests of the, well, the wealthy class in the United States at that time. And uh, he said to President Adams, I will declare unconstitutional any law that interferes with your rights. And he did. He declared unconstitutional 44 perfectly valid laws that infringe on the, the rights of the big landowners at that time. And uh, how can you have confidence <laughs> in, the, in the Supreme Court justice at all? Well, I mean, I, right now, I think the, the Supreme Court is very scary right now. I mean, John Marshall created judicial review and really did a, a phenomenal job of running that court. Almost all the decisions that came out under him were unanimous, which, I mean, try to imagine that today. Um, they didn't, they, when they were writing those decisions, they didn't write them uh, the way they do now. It was, a, it was a much different process. But I think there's a lot of reason to be suspicious and skeptical of this Supreme Court. Um, and of the federal judiciary in general. But again, I think that's a bigger reflection on what, is, what happened in Congress than, on what, than in what was happening in the courts. I mean, and you know, the difference between two and a half years ago, the courts were still unfriendly, especially to a lot of state church separation stuff. Um, I'm not saying that I have full confidence in them, and I think I just got through bashing them a little bit, saying that they're not the, the defenders of civil rights that we think they are. Um, but. But by and large, I think our system has worked well. Um, I mean, it's being tested right now in ways that that we certainly have never seen, and I don't know. I don't know that it will will survive the tests. I hope it does, but um, I think we we've gone past. I mean, it, yeah, I'll end that right there because. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'm wondering how susceptible the Supreme Court is to public opinion. I think I just saw a poll that said. Roe v. Wade has more support yeah. now, something like 70%, 74% in favor of keeping it now because of the overreach yeah. compared to 13% that would still push to get rid of it. Yeah. So, I'm, and I, I'm, I'm wondering, to my mind, I think that they lead from behind, which may be implied earlier. They, they, I don't know that they can override something no matter what they want to do if the, uh, if the, public opinion is so well, and that's part of our job to make sure our opinions are Yeah, and I mean, I think to a, to a certain extent you're right, and that, that's the question that, that I was answering for you, is how, you know, how much of their religion affects their, their jobs. And I think when you run into, the problem with religion in our system of government and injecting it into our system of government is that we are supposed to be based on reason, debate, and compromise. That is what is required out of the US system. And when you put religion into that, you are necessarily removing compromise and reason debate. You are making it about an article of faith, an unbending article of faith. And so I write about this actually a lot in the chapters uh, where I talk about the Civil War. Because the lead up to the Civil War, it, it, it's, it's largely a religious war to the extent that we don't talk about it, in the sense that it made slavery an issue of faith on both sides. And there was, an, we, we were the only nation that needed a civil war to end slavery. I mean, unless you want to count the, some of the slave revolts in the Caribbean, but the only nation that, where the slave class had to war against itself to end slavery. And that is because 
of the infiltration of evangelical religion into the political process during the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, I think. And I try to make that argument in, in the book. Um, so that's kind of, kind of a roundabout say, way of saying that I think the courts do need to listen to public opinion. But I think a lot of that goes out the window when you're talking about religion. And I think there's a damn good chance that Roe versus Wade is, the question is, will it die the death of a thousand cuts or will it be overturned explicitly? And I suspect it's gonna be some combination of both of those. The next three or four years, thousand cuts and then overturned probably on the 50th anniversary, unless something big changes. Can we go over here? Uh, can you speak to the- Can you stand up if you don't mind? Thanks. Can you speak to the distortion of how the Second Amendment is talked about you know, culturally and as also part of this uh, the Christian nationalist argument? Yes, so the, the... Yeah, how does the Second Amendment have to do with like the Christian nationalism angle of the Second Amendment? And, and how has it been distorted? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the Second Amendment, I don't know if I'll get this word for word, uh, a well-regulated militia being necessary for the freedom of the state. Uh, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That first clause about the militia should theoretically make that not an individual right, but a collective right. And there was a concerted effort by the NRA to push heavily legal scholarship away from that traditional understanding of the Second Amendment into understanding it as an individual right. And it is, it's not accurate historically, for sure, it is a distortion, but it is a model for how you push legal and judicial thought in a way that it is not meant to go. What they did was really uh, phenomenal, and I would love our side to be able to replicate it, not because we want to distort the interpretation of the Constitution, but because we want to get our interpretation, which is correct, as I've said, out there. Um, <laughs> And it, so, it, I mean, it, it was, and there, there have been papers that have been written about uh, how they did this and exposés written about it. I'm sure you can find plenty of them online. Um, but, but certainly the ties to Christian nationalism are, are there. On the drive down, uh, Bruce, the guy running the camera right now, was debating with his brother uh, on Facebook, and his brother was talking about our God-given right to bear arms. I mean, and that goes right to the heart of what I, we were talking about with the Declaration of Independence and, and you know, the idea that you are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And God-given God rights are talked about by the Christian nationalists as these, these unassailable, hallowed things, but really a God-given right can be taken away by anybody claiming to speak for God. They are, they are weak and flimsy. They are not the, the bastion that uh, the Christian nationalists think they are. Human rights, which you have simply by virtue of being a human being, are far more robust and incorruptible. Uh, so, I mean, God-given rights are, are not, and I talk, I talk a lot about this in the book, um, and I will get off my soapbox on it because I could spend a long time on that. Let one. me go back there. You talk about tactics a little bit. If you're engaging a person who's a Christian nationalist, it sometimes is frustrating to use a litany of facts or yeah. you know, a vast number of footnotes you put in, you know, 90 in the first introduction alone. But it doesn't seem to you know, cover a lot of ground in those kind of debates. What uh, advice do you have for people who are engaging and trying to make minds change? So what tactics to use with Christian nationalists? Yeah, and I think you're right to, to point out that facts are are not as powerful as we think they are. We need, we need better arguments. Our side absolutely needs better arguments. And that, that is what I'm trying to do in the subtitle of this book. I think mean, we have to label them. First of all, use the term Christian nationalist when you can. Um, that phrase, that label is very clear. People understand it without necessarily knowing what it is. They under, and they are afraid of it. Uh, right now, there's a new poll said, uh, Morning Consult said that 47% of the country view Christian nationalism as a threat. If you would have looked at that before Trump took office, that would have been probably almost non-existent. Most people didn't know what Christian nationalism was. But I, re I really think we need to hit them where it hurts. It, the, the goal of Christian nationalism, as I said at the beginning, really is 
to redefine what it is to be an American, and then to reshape our law accordingly. Right? We need to show them that patriotism has no religion, that a secular America is far more American than a Christian America. And in fact, that a, a, an idea of a Christian America, I, an, the idea of a Christian government, the idea of a government based on Judeo-Christian principles is un-American. They, they have successfully stolen patriotism from the country. And I think we, need to, we really need to push back on that. I mean, if I, I bet some of you, when I said that thought, some of you are kind of repulsed by the idea of patriotism a, a little bit. I think you think maybe of a MAGA hat. Right? I, I bet I, I bet that some that went through some people's minds. And it should we should be that should be what we think of when we think of un American. Um, so that that's really one of the big things that I try to push and do in the book is give you better arguments throughout so that you don't just have to rely on these these facts. Uh, because there are alternative facts out there. Right? Oh my god. So maybe <laughs> let me go over here. Three questions, stand up if you don't mind. I'll, I'll try to be better about my answers, Tom. Yeah, um, first, uh, congratulations on, on finishing and releasing your book. Uh, I've made it through the, the first part. It's really fantastically written. So I'm looking forward already to the next one. Um, are you, have you uh, started writing anything else um, after you got finished with this book? Are you going to wait until the end of your uh, book tour? And can we expect something else before Jar Jar Martin releases his next book? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't know what George R.R.'s schedule is. I, I have an idea for another book, um, and I'm, I may work on a proposal for that by, uh, near the end of the year. I'm wor right now working on a couple law review articles. Uh, they're in the publication process, uh, so some more heavy stuff. And then we have a pretty heavy litigation schedule at FFRF uh, over the summer. Um, so I won't, it won't be for a while, but I, uh, it might be before. George R. R. I mean, this one took me like almost 10 years, and the next one should not take that long. So. Uh, let me jump over here in the front, and then. Uh, yes, uh, so as far as like, there's a lot of focus on the Supreme Court, uh, but how, how concerned are you uh, more or equally concerned about uh, district and appellate courts and how many conservatives there are on those? Because even in Illinois, which is a very blue yeah. state, we have a lot of conservative judges. And that can affect standing. And the second part to that question is, how well do you think uh, minority religions and or groups like the Satanic Temple can affect <coughs> or change standing and use it to subvert the Christian, uh, Christian nationalists to sort of use it for their own purposes or get them to shut down uh, what they're going for? Yeah. I mean, really, judges at the non-Supreme Court level are the bigger problem that we're going to face, because they're going to take 99, literally 99% of the cases they are going to be deciding. So they're going to have probably overall a bigger impact than the justices on the Supreme Court, probably. I mean, of course, it's only the Supreme Court that can go and overturn Roe versus Wade, though, um, or the Lemon Test, for instance. So um, th there is a counter argument to that. Um, the, the second part on whether or not groups like the Satanic Temple can be effective, I certainly think they can be effective in in a lot of arenas. Um, and they're, they're, one of my favorite stories from working at FFRF was there was a, a, a park in San Diego where they had a nativity scene. And we wrote them letters, you've got to take the nativity scene down. That's, that's unconstitutional. And they said, no, 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 anybody can put up any scene they want, any uh, display they want during the holiday season in this park. And in fact, we're going to have, um, I think it was 13 spots uh, fenced off spots where you can have, to, and we're going to lottery off the spots, and then uh, whoever wins the lottery gets to put up their uh, display at that spot. It was Santa Monica. Santa Monica, correct. Atheists won 11 of the 13 spots. <laughs> so they immediately said, okay, well, after this year, we're not doing that anymore. And they, stopped, they stopped the displays. So getting into the forum with your counter message. Like, which is, that, I mean, Satanic Temple has basically adopted that formula. Uh, that can be really, really effective um, when there's already a forum open. But of course, the main goal is to, to close that forum down and stop it altogether, which is what we were asking for in the first place. Uh, but that can be an effective way to do it. So all of you should give atheist invocations yep. and yeah. offer to do those things. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> One concern I have is that the federal courts are going to do what they've done with other things, which is to punt it to the states. 
So my, my question to you is, um, to some extent that's happened, but do you see that happening with separation of church and state issues more? And then what does America look like at that point? Uh, I don't necessarily see it happening. We are looking to the states more because the federal courts have been so unfriendly. We just won a big case in New Jersey, uh, saving the New Jersey taxpayers millions of dollars uh, because they were being taxed and then that money was then turned around and being given to historic churches uh, so that they could continue to worship by repairing their buildings. Um, and that's explicitly prohibited under the New Jersey Constitution. It's, it's a more stringent clause than the federal constitution. So we were able to successfully litigate that. Uh, got a unanimous decision from the New Jersey Supreme Court. Uh, we also took a case in California under the California Constitution and got a decision in that case. We ended up settling the case on a Friday, and the Supreme Court decided a case on Monday, the next Monday, that uh, might have changed their mind about what, how to settle the case. Uh, so, I mean, we've been looking to state courts often as more friendly in a lot of respects. And a lot of state courts have uh, corollaries to the First Amendment. So they have a state church separation that's really similar, um, but not uh, what's called coextensive. So not not precisely similar. The contours can be slightly different. Where they'll have they'll have like New Jersey has a no aid clause specifically saying that you can't send money taxpayer money to churches or preachers, for instance. Um, so they're better in some respects. Now, Andrew, could you? Explain a little bit what it takes to codify something into the Constitution uh, to the point where, in order to overturn it, it would require a constitutional convention. Uh, for example, Roe versus Wade, if it gets overturned by the Supreme Court, maybe another 10 years, if we have a different Supreme Court, 20 years, uh, they might make it constitutional again. How does that get codified? <coughs> uh, so so there, there are two basic ways to amend the Constitution. Uh, one is going through the typical amendment procedure that's laid out, and the second is what you mentioned, which is the Constitutional Convention, which is a really, uh, probably a bad idea all around. The Constitutional Convention has never been done for an amendment. All of our amendments have gone through the regular process, and the reason, I think the main reason for that is because in a Constitutional Convention, all bets are off. Right? The only precedent we have for the constitutional, a constitutional convention is the constitutional <laughs> convention. And they were technically just supposed to rewrite some of the Articles of Confederation. And instead, they threw it out, redid the whole thing, came up with this whole new system of government that, is, that was way better. Uh, but that precedent means that if we were to have another constitutional convention, they could really do anything they wanted. And the fight over who would get to be a delegate to that would be um, it would be nightmarish. Um, I don't I don't know that anybody actually wants another constitutional convention. So if you said, for instance, we want to have a con con about putting a uh, woman's right to choose or bodily autonomy in the U.S. Constitution, then you have the constitutional convention. It's behind closed doors. At the at their first constitutional convention, nobody knew what was going on behind those closed doors. It was secret. Um, they come out and say, okay, we've rewritten the Constitution. Everybody gets a machine gun and a tank, and Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. And what do you do? I mean, the only precedent is you, you vote to ratify or not. Um, you can't, there's no real way to challenge it. So I think most people who have looked at this think a constitutional convention is a bad idea and that it's better to get states to ratify individual amendments um, as, as we've seen in the past. And that would be my vote. We have a couple more questions. Yes. Uh, I I'm just making it really hard for Bruce. <laughs> it's, it's my goal. Uh, big Facebook fan of yours. Uh, Thank you. I had a quick question on uh, Kavanaugh and Gorsuch. What, if anything, have they indicated in the past on how they view the separation of church and state? That was this indication of what could be coming down. Gorsuch wants to overturn the lemon test. He stated so explicitly. He called it the dog's breakfast, the dog's supper. Yeah, some, 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 some dog meal <laughs> in oral argument. And Kavanaugh has said, uh, agreeing with Chief Justice Rehnquist at the time, said uh, it's a bad, the wall of separation is a bad metaphor based on bad history and said it should be overturned. They are two votes very firmly for 
completely demolishing the wall of separation between state and church. Kavanaugh ruled against Michael Newdow trying to get in God we trust, or was it, it was something else at, when he was on the D.C. circuit? The, the inauguration, uh, trying to get religion out of the inauguration, the presidential inauguration. And he, so if you remember earlier, I said that the conservative justices are going to stop focusing on standing. Yeah. They're going to start deciding on the merits. Kavanaugh laid out the roadmap for that in the case that Hemant just mentioned. He said, yeah, 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 you definitely have standing to challenge this. You're just 100% wrong, and you lose bad. He was nice about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any one more? Yes. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question. Um, when legislators and states put forth bills they know are constitutional based on current law, um, is there any sense about whether or not there's like they have a fiduciary duty not to do that? Because it's going to be really expensive when they're mitigated? It's almost like they took an oath to uphold the Constitution and how it was interpreted, and they're just ignoring it. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think you, there's absolutely an argument that what they are doing is illegal and unconstitutional, but they, they're doing it on purpose. And I, the only way to hold them responsible, and the only way you, if you could ever bring a challenge like that in court, what the court would say is, yeah, the only way to hold them responsible is uh, to vote them out of office. Cool. Um, Andrew is here for a little bit. If you have other questions, make sure you pick up a book if you haven't already. Let's give it up for Jerry Coyne. <laughs> Yeah, it was, I've heard good things. And Joanne Freeman, who uh, was one of the. Uh,